Welcome to the uh, second uh, anniversary of Mim of the Year. It's really a pleasure to have Barthi Wilson from the University of Illinois with us today. And uh, we're just looking forward to what you have to say for us. Janet, uh, who is our faculty host, will introduce her in a minute. I do want to say thanks to uh, the people who put in so much hard work in organizing these conferences, particularly uh, Jeff Baum and Diane Gutman and Tabby Cron. And I'd also like to say thanks to our student host, every, every uh, guest we have, we have a student host, and Alicia Cohen, Michelle Schumann, and uh, Alan Bryant uh, helped out in that capacity. So thanks very much, ladies, for your help with that. And uh, I want to thank Janet, Janet Polk, our faculty host. And I also wanted to announce uh, future colloquia. We have uh, Manuel Castells, who will be visiting us from the University of California in Berkeley. And if you want to uh, jot this down in your timekeepers, uh, it will be Thursday, November 14th. And the time will be different than this. It will be at 4.30 in the afternoon in the Amber uh, Auditorium. And we'll be talking uh, on topics that are related to the new book, The Internet Galaxy. I also want to announce that uh, Klaus Schoenbach will be here from the University of Amsterdam. He will be on Tuesday, February 4th at 12.15 here in this room. And he is going to talk on the trap effect of television, specifically the political impact on TV, of TV, I should say, on those who are not interested in politics. And for those of you uh, who um, would like to give a little forerunner of that, he just had an article published on that same topic in Communications for Justice. So, um, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Janet Polk, who's a professor here at the Unheard School, who will introduce us. But we're really delighted to have with us here today Barbara Wilson, who's one of the very top researchers in the world in the area of children's death, TV television. And we're particularly pleased to have Barbara here because she represents both of the pieces of what we are here in the Amherst School, having gotten her bachelor's degree in journalism and her advanced degree in communication. She represents the line of what we do here at the Amherst School. Her, the focus of the research, as you see, that she'll present some of this today, is on children's emotional reaction to television content. There's been a lot of research done on the entertainment content of children's reaction to that, but, but her work also focuses on news content, which is an area that's gotten considerably less attention to an area of content to which children are regularly exposed, uh, particularly in this day of the cycle that's being on violence. She's interested in how exposure to different types of content, particularly violent content, affects their cognitive and emotional development. She's currently, uh, as I think Peter noted, at the University of Illinois, but prior to that, she <coughs> spent more than 10 years, about 12 years, at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And while there, she was part of an extensively funded project on the National Television Violence Center. Particularly important because this report, you probably saw uh, the results of this report in the media, was highly publicized, the work of this, and has had a major impact on policy in Washington. She's also had a number of other funded projects, and she's also served as an evaluator on the Center for Disease Control's multimedia campaign to try to promote healthy lifestyles in children. This is in response to uh, the alarming statistics on the amount of uh, obesity and loss of exercise in part of America. She's published very extensively in, in a variety of different fields, in places like communication in journals, like journal communication, but also in psychology, the youth psychology journal. And her most recent book, which I'll put in a plug for right here, uh, <laughs> just published this year by Sage Publications. Is entitled Children, Adolescents, and the Media, where she tries to 
a major overview of the search news areas, including a variety of things, well beyond television, including electronic games, sexuality in the media, drugs in the media, rock music, rock videos, and eating disorders as well, as well as the internet. So I encourage you all to uh, check out this book and see from what she has to present some of these initiatives behind it. That's our work. Thank you. Thanks. You might want to just check out the book and not buy it because it's a lot more expensive than I thought it was. I'm really delighted to be here and I thank all of you for inviting me. Uh, as Janet mentioned, I was in Santa Barbara for 12 years. And, and don't ask me why I moved to the middle of the cornfield. Okay? <laughs> too many people ask me that and assume that I've sort of lost my mind in the face of it all. But this is my first trip back to California since I moved two years ago. So it took you know, your efforts to get me back here. And I was telling Allie and Michelle when I got off the airplane, I couldn't wait to feel that sun again in my face. <laughs> and I looked around and I said, wait a minute, this isn't June. What is going on here? What's all this fog doing here? So I'm just sure that sun is going to come out before the end of the day and you'll probably see me sneak outside and stand in it for a few minutes. So anyway, thank you. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks today on some research that I've been involved in uh, for several years dealing with the news media and children. And uh, I, I want to just suggest to you that when I got involved in this area of research many years ago, I won't give you a number, uh, we were really looking at entertainment media primarily and primarily looking at the kinds of things that frighten children of different ages. And every so often in our studies, we would find glimpses of evidence that the news uh, was also frightening the children, but we kind of ignored that and always put it aside and thought, no, we're going to stick with fictional programming, stick with entertainment. And eventually, the evidence just became too overwhelming and we couldn't ignore it anymore. So in the last few years, we've really shifted and started to look primarily at the news as uh, a type of genre, if you will, that frightens children. Now, I don't want to get into a long discussion about what is news versus what is entertainment. We could spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, let's uh, focus primarily on, uh, uh, shall we say, um, nightly news, programming that is sort of breaking news stories, that kind of thing. We've also done some work on kids' reactions to current affairs and hard copy and things like that, which lead in more into sleep. So you'll see my language in my research. Um, that moves more into the entertainment, but primarily what we've been looking at is breaking news and news stories that are, are focusing in the genre of standard news programming. So, um, also when I say we, I've got lots of collaborators in this research. You'll notice um, that one of my main collaborators is Chase Smith, who used to be a graduate student of mine, who's now at Michigan State University. So I just want to acknowledge her and a lot of graduate students who are working hard uh, we're working hard at Santa Barbara and are now working hard at Illinois. Uh, so let me get to the stage here, and I'm sorry if you're in the back and your eyes can't read this, but I'll read it for you. This is probably the smallest font I've got. So um, this is an article in Paris Magazine several years ago. Imagine the evening news through a child's eyes. Families in Kosovo cry bitter tears as they are forced from their homes. An Amtrak crash crushes children on vacation. Jean Benet Ramsey is found murdered in her own basement. A plane plunges into the ocean and a baby's shoe is left floating in the water. Even school isn't safe. Within one year, children in seven different states open fire on their classmates and teachers. Uh, today, just this morning, if any of you were watching the Today Show, there was a child psychologist being interviewed about children's reactions to the sniper and to all these stories in the media dealing with the sniper. So you can come up with a lot of examples of this. Um, this was a comic I uh, found uh, uh, just very recently which suggests that breaking news might actually be more frightening to children than Halloween, okay? Um, you can see the kids in their costumes and they're looking at TV and they say, okay, you win. You're more scary than anything we could dress up as in, in, uh, in this particular holiday. Uh, here's some examples of some stories that have occurred in the news in the last um, several years that at least anecdotally we know children have responded to. I mentioned the, the murder of John Benet Ramsey, obviously the bombing of a federal uh, building in Oklahoma, the kidnapping case of Polly Cox in Northern California where she was taken uh, 
right from the bedroom caused a lot of concern. And these are just a few examples of stories that have really caught people's attention, have caught children's attention, and certainly have caught parents' attention. Obviously, we can't ignore the bombing of the World Trade Center uh, towers, and many children got uh, exposed to that by virtue of the fact that television is, is on in many homes for 24 hours a day or as many hours as people are awake during this phenomenon, during this attack, and I heard that your TV downstairs got installed as a result of the September 11th attack. So people were glued to television. A lot of children responded to this. Parents got concerned about how to deal with this story because children were seeing it, being exposed to it uh, in, in lots of different contexts. I put this article uh, out of our local paper in uh, Champaign-Urbana and the article again, small font, sorry. <clears throat> Carolyn Jones, kindergarten daughter, Al uh, Alyssa, drew a picture on a Red Cross envelope not long after September 11th. A drawing of two tall buildings side by side with an airplane going by. There were also a lot of little black dots all over, Jones recalled. She asked Alyssa what all the dots were. Mommy, that's all the people jumping out of the window, Alyssa answered. And the mother said she's doing well now. But she still asks why people are sad and why mommy watches the news a lot. Now, if you can read the date on this article, this is a year later, okay? And they're still having family discussions about this uh, particular news event. Well, why is it that news might be scary to children and maybe even to adults? I don't want to ignore adults and adolescents in here, but my own research is focused mostly on children and families. A couple of things that you should be aware of or um, may not be aware of. Content analyses, recent content analyses of the news suggest that well over half the stories uh, in national news focus on crime, violence, or on natural disasters. So there's a lot of focus, there's a lot of packaging in the news of certain types of stories, um, and we can talk later if you want to about why it is that the news is focusing primarily on these kinds of stories, but they're all over the place. They tend to um, dominate the content in news. Uh, again, another part to read may be fun, but uh, the uh, Enzyme Flattery and Halfman uh, looked at time, uh, over time changes in the news and found that there's been a 30% increase in the time devoted to sensational stories since the 1970s. So they actually continued to analyze early stories, more recent stories, and found that the trend is toward increasing sensationalizing you know, more crime, more violence than in the past. And a study by Dale Kunkel several years ago looked at how children are depicted in the news, content analysis, and found that nearly half of the child-oriented stories on broadcast network news feature children as either victims or perpetrators of violence. Okay? So the world of news is increasingly violent, increasingly uh, full of trauma, if you will, and, and more often than not, children, if they are portrayed, are involved in this violence. Here's another comic I clipped not long ago. Tell me again how you used to run and play without fear in the world. And on the screen you can see 24-hour kidnapping updates. And this is a response to all of these stories that have been in the news in the last two years of kidnappings, child uh, abductions, many of which have occurred right in people's homes or on their front steps. And it seems to, at least it seems from our impression, that there are more of these and a lot of parents have really altered the way that they respond to their children's activities and how safe they feel uh, with children going outside or not going outside, even in their own neighborhood. Okay. All right, well, do children watch the news? Um, I figure I'd, I'd better at least convince you that before I tell you about what their reactions are, because one of the really interesting paradoxes in all of this is that a lot of adults, and particularly parents, think that their children aren't watching the news. They think that news is made for adults, and they often uh, are, are somewhat naive about whether children are passively being exposed to the news in their own home, because the news is on, but the parent is watching the news and doesn't think to whether or not the child who seems to be playing in the corner with something else is listening or watching the kinds of things that are going on in the screen. And as it turns out, children do watch the news more than we might um, expect. In a national poll, uh, by Children Now, which is a uh, sort of a media interest advocacy group, if you will, found that 65% uh, of a 
11 to 16 year olds reported watching news on the previous day, okay? And even the Nielsen ratings suggest to us that a lot of children are watching the news. Um, One million children between two to 11 years of age watch the evening network news on any given day. Uh, we also find in our surveys that huge proportions of children, large proportions of children are watching the news. Now, one thing I should just stop and say, why am I focusing so much on television as opposed to other technologies and other media? Uh, as it turns out that, at least in this country, children still spend the large, largest per majority or percentage of time of their media time with television as opposed to other technologies. That's certainly going to shift with time, but uh, the largest media habit study we have, which was done by Robert, uh, Don Roberts and his colleagues, funded by the Kaiser Foundation, uh, only about two years old, and they, the national study suggests that the average child in this country spends six hours a day with the media, and at least three hours of that is with television, and then the rest is carved up into radio and, and computers and all the other technologies. So television is still, at least in this country, the dominant source of media for most children, okay? All right. Now, are children frightened by the news? Obviously, I think they are. I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be talking about this topic, but I want, I'd like to help you appreciate this as well. Um, as it turns out, there are um, several studies of, of children's fright reactions that are um, focused primarily on what I call catastrophic events, where researchers, um, something happens awful in the country and researchers went out and collect data on it. Um, one of the earliest is a, a study of the Kennedy assassination, and Siegel did a, a large study of um, uh, fourth through eleventh graders and found the majority of children felt um, sad and angry after the assassination. A lot of them felt scared. Uh, more recently, Wright and a colleague, uh, John Wright and, and several colleagues did a study on the Challenger explosion, which is called, actually had a teacher on board, and did a survey of children's reactions there and found some very strong emotional reactions as a result of that. And there's been a lot of research on the Gulf War as well and on children's reactions to the media coverage of the Gulf War. In all of these studies, uh, in a, the answer is yes, children do experience fear. Um, usually the percentages are quite high in terms of children's reports of their own reactions and even the parents' <coughs> reports of their own reactions. And the other interesting thing is that many of the studies point to developmental differences in the kinds of things that frighten children, the sorts of images and types of stories that children of different ages respond to. And that makes good sense if you know anything about developmental psychology and about how children progress cognitively uh, from very early age on uh, to uh, slightly older. So I'm going to spend a moment talking about that, but um, first I'd like to sort of introduce the research that we've done. Uh, responding to all these catastrophic studies, uh, Stacey Smith and I several years ago said, you know, this is interesting and it's great. You can always find these events and study them, but what about everyday news? Because this is what children are, are seeing most of the time. Uh, um, unfortunately, I guess these catastrophic events are happening all too uh, frequently lately, but most of the time what children are responding to is everyday news, the kinds of things that occur every day. And frankly, LA news uh, is quite different than a lot of other news that um, that kids might get exposed to, but we were really interested in what is it that children remember and how do they respond to everyday news as opposed to these major world or national events. And so in one of the first studies that we did, and this is a study that um, came out in uh, media psychology recently, we decided to um, interview children as sort of a preliminary kind of study to look at what children are remembering, how much they're watching, how well they comprehend the news, and we interviewed 125 children from two different age groups, kindergarten through third and fourth through sixth. Almost all of what I talk about today will be focused on elementary school children. I have not done much research on adolescents. It's not because I don't like teenagers, but I just haven't gotten into that age group yet. We've had a whole new set of developmental issues, and I think it's an area that we need to do more research in as media scholars. But most of my work is focused on um, elementary school children. And we were interested in this interview particularly in how well children can comprehend the news, what kinds of emotional reactions they have, and we were in, even interested in their perceptions of crime in the real world as a result of news or exposure, or at least if, whether they were connected. Before we start, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time talking about information processing and about what it is that children bring to the television experience that might help us predict 
children of different ages responding differently to the same news story. Um, it's always tricky when you talk about development because you can't give people precise ages associated with development. Some children progress faster than other children. Um, so, you know, I'm always asking, what do you mean by younger versus older? And all I can do is give you broad strokes here and suggest to you that generally when people talk about younger versus older, they're talking about preschool and early elementary school children versus older elementary school children. Some children shift more quickly, some are cognitively uh, more sophisticated, but between these two time periods, preschool, early elementary, older elementary school, we see some major shifts in how children process information. What are some of those shifts that might be connected to the news? Well, one shift we see is in their ability to comprehend verbally presented information. When you think about the news, it's quite different than entertainment programming because a lot of it is talking heads. People telling you stories, um, newscasters giving you information, and you do get video, but you don't get video for the whole story. You might get a quick video clip or a still shot up in the corner by the person's head, but a lot of it is uh, information that's presented verbally, and a child has got to understand that information in order to follow the story. As it turns out, there's two sort of um, challenges here. One is language skills. Think about the word sniper, for example. How many preschoolers know what a sniper is? Okay, not very many. But older children are probably more likely <laughs> nowadays to know what a sniper is. So there's a lot of um, issues regarding just language and the choice of words that are given in the news, and, and we would expect that younger children are going to struggle more with some of the language and some of the words that are used in the news uh, compared to older children. There's also an issue of, of the ability to draw inferences. And, um, this is true even in entertainment programming. Children uh, have got to be able to connect information across time and space, to hear one thing and deduce something from it because you aren't given all the information. News stories are short and they, they, you have to draw connections between the information that's given you. You have to um, sometimes fill in the gaps because you don't actually see the story, you're only told about it. And so a lot of news requires children to draw linkages draw inferences from verbally presented information. As it turns out, there's several studies out there, um, again, I called it the widescreen is stretching my font out, but um, at any rate, there's a lot of studies out there that show that younger children are less able to draw these kinds of inferences from verbally presented information, either from television programs, from stories they hear, from uh, uh, fairy tales that they're read, um, all the different kinds of media content, younger children, uh, less able to draw inferences. Another information processing skill that is important in terms of understanding the news and reacting to the news is the ability to differentiate fantasy from reality. As it turns out, there's a whole body of research out there in the, in the media world as well as in psychology that shows that children go through very strong and powerful developmental changes in their understanding of what's real and what's not real. If you've been around children who are very young, you know that they respond to things on television as if it's very real, and, and they don't make a lot of distinctions between what they see on the screen and what they see in real life. Um, and there's a lot of research to support this. Anecdotally, I can tell you that my youngest child really wants Barney to come over for a play date right now, okay? And she's convinced that Barney is a purple dinosaur, and all we have to do is invite him. We haven't really gotten clarity on who his mom is, because usually we have to call a mom to ask for a play date. So we're not really sure how we do that. But she wants Barney to come over and have a play date. And for a three- or four-year-old, this makes perfect sense. Uh, so there are some very strong developmental differences in understanding of reality fantasy as children progress into the elementary school years. They start to really make sense of the notion that television is a representation of reality and that within television, programs and genres differ in how realistic they are. So that as children get to the upper elementary school years, they're going to be much more responsive to programming that is realistic, particularly programming that reflects events that really happen in the real world. So again, this kind of dimension would suggest to us that younger children are going to respond differently to the news and not perhaps make a big distinction between news and fictional programming, whereas older children are going to make more of this distinction. Last but not least, um, there's also a shift during this time from what has been called perceptual to conceptual processing. And this is a fancy way of 
of, of reflecting the fact that very young children, preschoolers and early elementary school children, are responding very much to the way that things look and sound. It's been called perceptual dependence in psychology and in child development. So I, I prefer perceptual processing. But it, it really reflects the idea that young children are gripped by the visual cues, by the way things sound, and they often can't get beyond that. So they're really, um, uh, um, a lot of their thinking and a lot of their responses are, are very strongly tied to the way things look on the screen. As children get older, they start to be able to deal more with the fact that uh, things aren't often the way they look on the screen, and they move back to a more conceptual understanding, a more abstract understanding of what is going on in a program or even in a news story. They start thinking about things like the motive of a character or a person. They start thinking about issues of how probable something is versus not probable. They start thinking about um, uh, information related to, well, where did this occur, for example? Did it occur here or somewhere else? Um, and so these are all examples of more abstract thinking, shifting more towards um, concepts that aren't really shown, but concept, concepts that are very important to understanding a particular narrative in the media. Okay, so all of these shifts would suggest that younger children are going to respond differently than older children to the news. So in this particular study, study we had several hypotheses. We predicted, first of all, that older children would understand TV news more than younger children would, in part because of the um, ability to understand verbally presented information, in part because of their ability to, to engage in more conceptual processing. We also predicted that older children would report TV news uh, to be more frightening than younger children would, in part because they're responding to the realism of it. They're more sensitive to the fact that news is different than entertainment programming, and they're thinking more about what could happen in the real world as a result of what they see on the screen. And then last but not least, we predicted that the types of stories that would frighten children would differ with development, would differ by age. In particular, what we thought is that stories that had very strong visual components, a lot of video, very scary video, would be much more upsetting to a younger child than stories that are conveyed without a lot of video. Okay? And I'll give you some examples of what that distinction means in a minute. Okay, well here's some examples of some data from this first study. Again, this is the interview study where we asked children a whole series of questions and compared younger and, and older children. And many of our hypotheses were supported, as you can see. For example, we asked about the comprehension of the purpose of TV news. Um, and we found some strong age differences in children's ability to understand what news is even all about. And we did both open-ended and forced choice questions uh, in, in this study. So if you're curious about particular measures, you can ask me. But in the, uh, I think I'll move quickly rather than get stuck on details and we can come back. We also asked children whether they understood the news. And so we were interested in their own sort of perceived understanding, and we found age differences here. Older children thought they understood the news better than younger children did. Uh, and then we asked, how often do you talk to a your mom or your dad about the news? And we found age differences here as well. Older children were much more likely to report that they talked with their parents about the news than younger children were. All of these are uh, significantly different depending upon the test that we did, and I could go into that too if anybody's curious, but I bet you're not, so we won't. Um, we also asked how scary they thought TV news was. And again, supporting our hypothesis, older children were more likely to rate TV news as scary than younger children were. We asked this both in an open-ended question and in a, in a forced choice rating kind of question, and we found age differences here as well. Now, what about the types of stories that children reported as scary? We asked children to describe a story they could remember that scared them. And in this sample of 125 children, 52% of them were able to very quickly describe in great detail a story that scared them. Okay. So what we did with these stories is we coded them for different types of stories. And in particular, we were interested in disaster stories versus crime stories. Disaster stories are things like earthquakes, um, car crashes, um, uh, uh, mudslides, things like that. And crime stories included things like murders, uh, kidnapping, uh, even robbery, for example. Okay, and what we found is what we predicted, and that is younger children much more likely to cite a disaster story than they were to, uh, to 
cite a crime story, and the opposite for the older kids, are much more likely to cite a crime story than a disaster story. Now, when you think about this, it makes sense in terms of that shift from perceptual to conceptual processing, because disaster stories often have great video footage of the aftermath or sometimes even the thing as it's happening. About, um, for example, although the, the World Trade Center for covered both of them, I was going to say police and both of these, and I don't want to use that word again, but um, really could be characterized as both. But when you think about earthquake stories and mudslides, there's often very graphic visual of the destruction of these stories um, that is included in the, in the story. But when you think about crime stories, uh, there's often not video footage of the crime as it's going on. It's only the aftermath, maybe a dead body, maybe police standing around investigating, but you rarely see much video footage in those cases of the actual violent event. You see the aftermath and you've got to infer what happened. So in our um, minds, this really supports this shift from perceptual to conceptual processing that I described a moment ago. Let me give you some examples. I don't know if you can see these or not. Some of the stories that children describe. Here's some disaster and accident stories. The mudslides, the one where the car almost slid off the bridge. Remember, it's really responding in this case to the visual footage of the car on the, on the bridge. Uh, second grade female, when there was a fire and a person died. Okay, fire is a very visual often story. Um, third grade male, when the lake overflowed into the houses like in Mississippi. Okay, uh, the third grader is a little bit older, um, but we have some examples in both cases of, of, of children responding with different stories. Now here's some crime stories. And these are all older children, fourth grade female. When I saw this guy do a bank robbery with a gun and everyone had to get down and give him money. Now in this case, there is some visual footage, obviously, but it still fits into the crime story. Uh, fifth grade male, when they showed a serial killer who was molesting kids. Sixth grade female, when that guy came into the little girl's house and um, they were having a slumber party and he killed her. That's the, the Polly Class story. So you can see the kids can make have vivid memories of some of the stories that they've seen, and in, in, in this study, we found that the stories that they're likely to remember were developmentally appropriate, if you will, or consistent with what we would expect from cognitive development. We also asked a research question in this study. We wondered about the relationship between exposure to TV news and children's beliefs about real-world crime, a la cultivation theory, for those of you who know that theory. Um, we were really interested in, all right, what about these kids who are watching a lot of news? Are they thinking the world is more scary, more violent, more um, dangerous than kids who don't watch the news very much? Um, and in this particular uh, study, we asked children two, well, actually four questions. We asked them, how many people were murdered in the last year, and how many children were kidnapped in the last year? And we asked them, this is a study I did in Santa Barbara, so these are all Santa Barbara children, and just come with everything. And they said a chuckle, murders in Santa Barbara. Okay, I know. But anyway, um, we asked them, how many murders in the last year, how many kidnappings in the last year? First we said, and we kind of balanced the order, we asked them about Santa Barbara, and we asked them about Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> And we gave them fourth choice options because we figured most kids would really have a hard time with this question if we didn't give them some options, okay? And so we gave them fourth choice options and they picked. And then, of course, what we wanted to do is see whether their estimates of crime were related to how much they watched the television news, okay? Here, I'm sorry, the font is a little small. Um, our estimations of kidnapping in Los Angeles. Oh, first of all, let me say, estimations of crime in Santa Barbara, nothing predicted that. Okay, none of our variables predicted estimations of crime in Santa Barbara. Why? Well, that's true. Most of the kids are, are watching LA News, although there is some Santa Barbara news. But <laughs> a lot of the news they're watching is LA based news, but, um, but there's just basically not a lot of crime in Santa Barbara. Okay, I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. It's a little ghetto there, and then we don't have a lot of murders there. I think I remember one or two the whole time I lived there. Well, it's a few more than that, but not very many. And kidnappings, I don't remember any. So, if, if you know, now, George Gerdner's original theorizing would say it doesn't matter. Anything you watch ought to 
boost these estimates, but um, many people subsequent to that have said, you know, you have to take into account real world experience and what you're watching. And in this case, nothing predicted estimations of crime in Santa Barbara. Kids' estimates were very low and appropriately so. What we did find, though, is estimates of Los Angeles crime were affected or predicted by news, but not of kidnappings. The only thing that predicted kidnappings was grade level, okay? If you can't read this, we um, move gender and grade level in, and this is a regression analysis through those in first. Then we control for how much they're watching television in general, independent of the news. And then we'll, on the last block, we put in the frequency of news viewing and how often or how much exposure they had to fictional media violence, which we measured by asking them about a series of violent TV shows and movies. We thought, well, we ought to separate that out and see if that's it. Nothing predicted estimations of kidnappings in Los Angeles. Now, if, um, at first we were a little puzzled by this, but then we looked at constant analysis. There's one very recently done by Travis Gibson of Los Angeles News, and as it turns out, some 30% of crime stories in Los Angeles involve murders, but well less than 5% involve kidnappings. So even though we have a sense there's a lot of kidnappings out there, if you watch Daily News, you don't see very many kidnapping stories. But look what happens with murders, estimations of murders in Los Angeles. Uh, the regression analysis, once again, is pretty age level, but so did frequency of the news viewing. So the more kids were watching the news, the higher their estimates were of murders in Los Angeles. Now the question is, um, maybe they're right. Maybe if they're watching a lot of Los Angeles news, they should be predicting more murders. Um, so we looked at that. We actually um, got statistics on how many murders there were the previous year, which was 2001, and there were 849 murders in Los Angeles during that year, okay, uh, 2001. And what we did is compare that to um, children's estimates based on how much they watch news. Almost never some days, most days, or every day. And what you can see is that when you get the children watching news every day, they're overestimating the number of murders in Los Angeles. Okay? Um, underestimating when you don't, almost never watch the news. Okay? So in this case, we have evidence that exposure to TV violence is predicting higher estimates of crime in Los Angeles. Again, it's all correlational data, but we did control for some of the most obvious confounds. All right, well, at this point we decided it's time to move into the laboratory because what we've got so far is children's retrospective memories of the things that scare them. But what we don't really have to handle on is what kinds of things might frighten children uh, if we really can control for things and actually control for features of the news. So our second study, and this uh, appeared in Commerce Search, um, was an experimental test of news features. And we were really interested in um, what kinds of things about news stories might scare kids, and particularly what kinds of things might scare children of different ages. Okay, so we really wanted to move some of this into, into the lab and see if we could test certain features. And when we thought about what kinds of things might enhance children's fear, we looked to the previous research, um, and we looked at a lot of the anecdotal evidence, and two things that, that sort of struck us were graphic visual images. Do they enhance? or detract from fear, we expect that they would enhance, and we'll get that in a minute. And what about the proximity of the crime? If something happened closer to home versus further away, is that going to affect a child in terms of fear? So these are the two pieces we were interested in in this um, first study. And we looked at the literature in order to figure out what we might expect. And as it turns out, there are no studies of children's reactions to impact as visual images. Now there is, but there wasn't before we ran the study. But there are some studies of adult reactions and even some controlled studies. The one by um, Annie Lang and her colleagues actually manipulated whether there were graphic scenes of violence and, and blood and, and whatnot and, and uh, found that stories that contained those on television were much scarier to adults than stories that didn't have those visual images. Um, and some, several researchers have argued that there may be an evolutionary basis to us responding to stories involving murder and blood and injury because we may, in fact, for survival purposes, be very responsive to these kinds of visual images. It may have been necessary for us to, to flee and to be really responsive to these kinds of things. So we predicted, actually, that um, it wouldn't matter much what age a child was, because if adults are responding to visual images and video footage, then we, we expected children of all ages would uh, respond more uh, to, to, to stories that contain graphic video footage. 
um, that they would be more frightened by them, more aroused by them than if the same story didn't have that video footage. Now, what about proximity of crime? That's another feature, and it's slightly different than um, video footage. Uh, we do have evidence, at least in the adult arena, that when adults read a story and they're told that it happened nearby, they respond more uh, with more fear and more anxiety than if they learn the story happened right far away. You might be really glad right now that you don't live near Maryland and Washington, right? And a lot of us feel that way. Even during the World Trade Center, um, uh, attack. I sort of felt, maybe it's good I went to the prairie, you know, I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's no reason anybody's going to want to come here, okay? So you, we do, as adults, respond to the proximity of an event, and sometimes it's reassuring if it's far away versus nearby, and in fact, there's research to support that. But when we think about children, we can expect that there are probably going to be some developmental differences in how children respond to proximity. So one, they have to understand geographical distances. They have to know where they live, and, and they have to know where these other cities or countries are. And if they don't understand that, then proximity cues are not going to matter. In this particular study, we intentionally chose two cities we knew children knew about. Uh, children, and this, by the way, this is also Santa Barbara's study. Okay. So children in the study lived in Santa Barbara, and we chose two cities, Santa Barbara and Los Angeles. We piloted and found that all elementary school kids know that they live in Santa Barbara or know where they live, and many of them knew that where Los Angeles, roughly where Los Angeles was. Okay, so we figured we're going to take care of that problem by picking two places that they know about. But the other thing that you have to do with proximity cues is you have to be drawing inferences about your own personal risk. So if you hear that a story occurred nearby, then you draw this inference, I'm more at risk. If you hear that a story occurred far away, then you say, I don't have to worry as much. This won't happen to me because it happens on the coast or it happens somewhere else, not here. And that involves inference skills, which we've already talked about are developmentally acquired. It's not something young children do very easily. So as a consequence of this, even though we picked two easy cities, we predicted that older children who hear a crime uh, occurs locally will experience more fear than if they hear it occurred in a uh, city nearby, if you will. But we picked, uh, predicted that younger children won't be responsive. Their emotions won't change as a result of the proximity cues, in part because of this inference issue. Okay? Now, what did we do in this study? As I mentioned to you, this was an experiment. We had 88 children in Santa Barbara. Poor Santa Barbara kids. Um, now I'm in a different city and I traumatize other children. But anyway, um, two different age groups, six to seven year olds and 10 to 11. So again, we're trying to tap into some of those developmental shifts that occur. And in this case, all children saw a story about um, a young boy who was attacked by gangs. And he was not a gang member. The story was clear he was not a gang member. This was a real story that we took off the news. Um, and we, uh, we edited the video footage. Some kids saw the video footage, 34 seconds, that showed the victim, uh, the boy being um, put into an ambulance. You could see it didn't show the action, didn't show the attack, but showed the aftermath. Saw a bloody knife on the ground, saw police milling about, okay? And the other half of the kids saw no video footage, just a talking head. Okay. Uh, we also manipulated the proximity cues. Half the children heard that this happened in Santa Barbara. The other half heard that it happened in Los Angeles. And they heard that four different times in the story. Okay. I should just stop and say, we redid this whole thing. We had undergraduates who were, going, who were doing internships at the local news station who dressed up and became the newscasters because we really wanted to control the story. So we used a real news story, but we re-edited it in the studio to make sure that we could control the, the audio of, of the different versions and the video of the different versions. And children saw um, a 10-minute news clip. This was the last story that they saw. So the other stories were just neutral kinds of filler items, something about President Clinton at the time going to Asia, um, something about nutrition and diet. I can't remember all the stories. But anyway, the other ones, we um, avoided violence at all costs, were just sort of filler stories, because we wanted to simulate a typical news experience for children. And this was the last story that they saw. Okay. Um, we measured a lot of things in this experiment. I won't cover all of them, but we obviously got self-reports of their emotional response after the story. We videotaped children while they were watching television so that we could later code facial expressions. 
We use a system by um, Carol Izzard called the Affect System that allows us to actually code different um, emotions in the upper and lower part of the page based on major expressions and uh, muscle changes associated with major emotions. We also um, asked them about their reasons for feeling scared or bad if they said they did. We um, coded their visual attention to the story because we thought maybe that might change as a result of the video footage. And we also had some measures that have the recall of the story. So a lot of measures, I'll only cover a few here. First of all, <clears throat> what about the manipulation check? Because we did remember half the children heard the ballet, half the children heard Santa Barbara. And we found that 70% of the children could accurately identify the location of the story. It's not 100, but remember we're dealing with kids here, not adults. And the important thing is there were no age differences in this. So younger children were just as able to detect where the story occurred as older children, which made us feel good because at least we're not, I mean, one possibility is that younger children don't even hear where things happen and they miss the proximity cues altogether. But in this case, they, there, was no, there were no age differences there. Okay, self-reported worry as a function of video footage. Remember what we predicted as a function of video footage? Um, this is one of these things where you get in the lab, you get back to your computer, and you analyze you, what? This is not what we predicted. This must be wrong. The analyze you took recall, make sure everything's coded right. No, this is what we found. Okay, remember we thought that video footage would actually enhance fear, as those who saw the video footage would feel more frightened, and in fact, we found the opposite. Okay, children who saw the video footage reported feeling less worried than children who didn't see the video footage. Flies in the face of all our hypothesizing, all the theorizing, all the previous research that's been done with adults. What's going on here? I'll come back to this issue, but I want you to be thinking about that, okay? Um, I can tell you that attention, visual attention, was higher if the kids had the video footage than if they didn't. So it's not that somehow they missed it. In fact, the video footage made them pay more attention to the story than if they didn't. And the video footage also enhanced recall. So it helped them remember the story better. But for some reason, it didn't enhance their word. Okay, we'll come back to that. I'm not done with that issue. Now, the proximity cues, remember I predicted, or we predicted, that there would be developmental differences in how children responded to where the news occurred. And in fact, we found that the older children were much more likely to be worried if the story was in Santa Barbara locally than if it was far away, okay? The other children tended to show the opposite pattern, but this was not statistically significant. So you can just imagine it's more or less flat here. And older children are responding to the proximity cues as we predicted. We also found this in facial fear, which is a good confirmation of self-reports. You often want a nonverbal indicator that helps you be certain of your verbal report. Again, uh, older children showing more facial fear if the story occurred locally than if it occurred in Los Angeles. Younger children not showing a lot of difference as a function of the proximity cues. Now, we predicted that the reason that we would find this developmental difference is because children would infer their own personal vulnerability, older children, if they heard that it occurred locally. And so in fact, we measured that. We asked children, if they said they felt worried, we asked them why. And we uh, recorded all their responses and later coded these for what we call story personalization. Anytime a child said, I felt worried because I was worried it might happen to me or something might happen to my family, and here's some examples. The same thing might happen to me. That person may find out where I live and kill someone in my family. Okay, so we coded any kind of child personalized, became more vulnerable as a result of the story or said that they did. Um, any time that happened, we coded that as, as story personalization. And we found the same interaction with age and proximity cues that we did with emotions. That is, older children were much more likely to personalize the story if it occurred in Santa Barbara than if it occurred in Los Angeles. Younger children not doing much story personalization anyway and not showing any difference between the two kids. Now remember, it's not because younger children don't know where these stories occurred because we didn't find any age difference there. But they're responding differently emotionally as a result of we hypothesized the story personalization. Further evidence of this we looked at the correlation between story personalization and fear, and it was positive and significant. So the more kids personalize a story, the more emotionally responsive they are to it. Okay. I'm going to quick run through a third study, and then I'm going to stop for questions. All right. The third study um, was motivated by this issue of video footage, because I, you know, we got to get back to this. What's the deal here? How can we get this? this 
bizarre effect where video footage actually reduced worry in the children. Can any of you think of an, a reason why that might be? Oh, I'll come back to you because that's one of them. Yeah. Okay, good. Two great reasons. That's good. And I never even pined you for this. <laughs> let, me, let me do one reason you didn't mention first. One possibility is that the images weren't that scary. After all, we can't really go in and, you know, scare the Jesus out of his in, in a laboratory. I've got all sorts of human subject issues here. And so my video, video footage may not be as intense as what might be really happening in the news. But that doesn't explain why it's less emotionally arousing to have it than to not have it. And both of your answers start to get us to there, I think. One is imagination. Maybe your imagination makes it worse than actually seeing the video footage, okay? Now, if that was true, you'd find that with adults, too, wouldn't you? And we didn't. With, if you look at the other research that's been done on adults, at least the couple of studies that are out there, adults don't do worse if there's no video. They, do, they get more scared. Uh, but one thing that might be possible here is that the more you show of a person, in this case a young male, who wasn't involved in gangs but was attacked by gangs, perhaps that allows kids to distance themselves. The more the victim is somebody you can't identify with, you can't imagine yourself in that situation, the less frightening it is. And seeing him there and somehow visualizing him might make you be able to do that more. And the second thing I think is that it's possible the video footage might actually ameliorate fear, depending on what's in the video footage. If you remember, this video footage contains police milling around, handling the situation, taking out for a lot of cops in that video footage. And it might actually be reassuring to a child to see that and know, think, that things are under control. The authorities have the situation in control versus not seeing that video footage. So we had to get back into the lab and see if we couldn't figure out what's going on and run another study. We also, in this third study, looked at age of the victim, which is another cue, particularly when you think about kidnapping, that children are, we think, responsive to. If the, if the victim is young, then they're going to be more likely to respond, we thought, uh, than if the victim is an adult. So in this case, we did a study with a totally different story. This time it was a real new story about a girl named Amber who was abducted in a dark area. And um, we changed the video footage in this study. First of all, we looked for a story where the dead body wasn't shown. There was a sheet covering Amber. So in a way that helps us with the distancing thing. We don't see her, we don't know what race. Well, actually, we do know what race she is in this case, because I'll share that with you in a minute. But to so see the dead body, it's, it's not one where you can say, that's not me, because you don't even see the face. It's very, um, it, it's sort of masked from you. Um, we, there was a weapon on the ground, but the really important thing is we didn't want a lot of police milling around. So we looked for video footage where there weren't, and in this case there were not. There were a couple of investigators around the body, but the bulk of the video coverage did not reassure you that the authorities were in control. Okay, So um, we hoped to get rid of that problem or get around that issue. Now, um, in terms of the age of the victim, we predicted, as you might guess, that children are going to be more responsive to a child's victim for several reasons. First, we know in the, in the literature that children pay more attention to younger characters. There's a lot of good studies out there, including uh, a really uh, fascinating one by Dan Anderson and several of his students where they videotape kids in homes and find, of course, whenever a kid comes on the screen, kids pay more attention to who's on the screen. So we expected that children would pay more attention. We also expected that children would identify more and empathize more with a child victim than an adult victim, and there's a lot of research in the uh, empathy area to support that. And we, um, we uh, also knew from a study done by Joanne Cantor and Amy Nathanson that children report anecdotally when they're asked to talk about study, uh, stories that, that frighten them, that a lot of them will report stories that involve child victims. So we had good reason to believe that children would be responsive to the age of the victim. Now in this study, 95 children, once again Santa Barbara, okay, that makes a difference to you, just thought I'd mention it. Two different age groups, first to third, fourth to sixth, video footage I've already described. Again, this was the last story in a series of stories, all of which were neutral except this one. Um, in this case, you definitely saw the murder weapon and the dead body, but far fewer police involved, um, or you saw no footage at all. 
and we manipulated the age of the victim. We said Amber was either a child or an adult. And the way that we reinforced that is that one of our graduate students brought in a picture of herself in the third grade and then a picture of a professional photograph of herself as an adult. And so she looked, I mean, it was the same person. And kids either saw a picture of Amber as a child or a picture of Amber as an adult. You know how they often show the little still photo over the shoulder of the newscaster. So, and the dead body was far enough away that it did not look like a child. It could have been an adult or a child. So half the kids heard that Amber was a nine-year-old child. The other half heard that she was a 24-year-old woman. Okay. All right. What did we find? Oh, first manipulation check. We asked children how old Amber was. And we found that only about 59% got it correct. Okay, so we have a huge failure in our manipulation here, all right? Um, part of the problem is that we asked them open-ended how old she was, and none of the kids could remember how old she was, okay? So um, we're now replicating this study and going back and with fourth choice questions. Was Amber a child or was she an adult, okay? So, you know, why didn't we think of this? I don't know. But you always learn as you do research that, you know, uh, your measures can be better if you just think about it a little bit. So we've gone back now since then and replicated this with fourth choice. The other thing is we did not emphasize enough in the audio track how old Amber was. And so now we've come back and redone the audio and emphasized age more. She's either 9 or she's 24. So suffice it to say the age manipulation did not work in this study. So we're going to focus on the video footage now, okay? What we did find is a strong effect for video footage in this study, and it's in the predicted direction. In other words, Kids who saw the video footage this time were more frightened, spontaneous reports of, of feeling scared, sad, worried. Um, and also when we coded specifically for how frightened they said they were, we also found a difference. If they saw the video footage, they were more frightened than if they didn't see the video footage. Um, we found this even when we asked them how worried they were and they rated their worry on a scale of zero to three. Um, video footage, more worried than without, and no age differences on any of these. Okay. And, interestingly, we found more personalization with the video footage than without. So kids who saw the video footage, even though, um, again, we didn't see the body, we see within the body, underneath the sheet, just saw the dead body, they're more likely to worry about themselves if they saw that than if they didn't see any video footage at all. So now we have what is much more consistent with the literature, a strong effect for video footage across several different measures, independent of age. Of the child. All right, now I'm going to summarize and then I'll open up questions. <coughs> what do we know from this series of studies and a couple more in the pipeline that I didn't describe today? First, we know that children do watch television news in this country, okay, and they're probably watching it more these days as a result of 24 hour news channels like CNN and other kinds of things than they even did when you and I were children. We also know that children can readily describe stories that frighten them. Okay? It's not very difficult for them to draw into their memories and come up with a vivid description of something that really frightens them. And we also know that there are some age differences in what we would expect uh, children to respond or how we would expect children to respond. Older children, and I'm giving you rough ages, age to 12, uh, watch TV news more. Okay, They're more interested in it. They they understand it more, they think they understand it more, and they also evidence more understanding. They are more susceptible to fear. They fri they're more frightened of it because, again, of those cognitive development issues we talked about earlier. And they're much more concerned about violent crime, all of which would suggest as a parent that this is the age of the tweens, as the advertisers call them, um, where you want to really be careful about children's exposure to television news. Okay? We also know that graphic images uh, affect children depending on what they are. And this is sort of the challenge, I think, for um, broadcasters as they think about what video footage to cut include if they're thinking about family sensitive news, which some channels actually do think about. Um, certain video footage may actually be helpful. Other video footage may actually make things worse. And so, at least in our case of these set of studies, what we would suggest is that. The more you show things out of control and show aspects of the crime, the scarier it's going to be. The more you can reassure people with video footage that things are in control, probably the less scary it's going to be. Uh, we also know that proximity of crime is an important cue, and particularly important for older ages. 
The more that it's closer to home, the more frightening it will be for older children. Younger children are not as responsive to those proximity cues, um, which can be a problem because then anything could be scary to them, even if it's far away. Okay, so this proximity issue can work both ways, and it's important to think about that um, in terms of predicting how children will respond. And last but not least, I don't want you to leave your thinking that age doesn't matter. We're in the process of replicating this study, doing a better job of making it clear how old Amber is, and doing a better job on our manipulation checks. And we're actually presenting some data at MCA um, for the next study in this series that shows that, in fact, if Amber is young and children recognize that, they're more scared, they're more frightened um, than if Amber is an adult. So, which again is consistent with a lot of the theorizing in this area. So, I think I will stop right now and 